Hello, everybody. This is Aaron Gelb with Con Maciel Carey's Chicago office. I'd like to welcome everybody to our 12th and final webinar of the year, Workplace Violence and Sexual Harassment, OSHA and Employment Law Issues. We are going to hopefully be covering a bunch of, of different aspects of the workplace violence issue, uh, both from an OSHA standpoint, as well as the, the various employment law risks and concerns that you all have to deal with throughout uh, your workplaces. We've added this uh, or added a focus on sexual harassment in particular uh, in light of the, the Me Too movement and the increased focus on sexual harassment and the sexual, obviously sexual violence angles that are involved as well with this issue. We've seen this come up in a number of, of industries, including hospitality, uh, the lodging industry, and so we're going to talk about some of those issues in particular. Um, and in the interest of getting started, we'll begin with a brief review of our bios. As I said, my name is Aaron Gelb. I'm a partner in the firm's Chicago office. I practice in both the OSHA Workplace Safety Group and the Labor and Employment Group. My practice is pretty evenly divided. Uh, on any given day, I find myself handling OSHA inspections on site for uh, incident responses, contesting uh, citations, negotiating settlements, litigating contested citations with OSHRC, um, but then also do a fair amount of employment litigation, handle an extensive amount of discrimination charges. Uh, I've been in private practice exclusively a management side employment lawyer for the past 25 years, uh, the majority of which in, Ch in Chicago. I attended the University of Chicago for college and the University of Texas for law school. So with that, I will hand it off to uh, Lindsay DeSalvo to introduce herself, and, and then uh, Megan Shaked will introduce herself as well. All right, good afternoon. Thanks, Aaron. This is Lindsay DeSalvo. Um, I'm an associate here at Kama CL Carey in both the OSHA and employment practices. Um, pursuant to my involvement in both practices, um, I represent employers and advise employers during OSHA enforcement actions and then contesting OSHA citations, including um, workplace violence citations under the general duty clause. And I also advise employers um, in their policies and procedures related to health and safety. Um, on the employment side, I uh, advise employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship. Uh, which includes issues and claims of sexual harassment and discrimination, um, and also review and provide advice on policies and procedures, uh, as well as employee handbooks related to those types of issues as well. And I'll turn it over to Megan to introduce herself. Thanks, Lindsay. This is Megan Shaked. I'm joining from our San Francisco office. Uh, and I also practice it. I'm a member of both the Workplace Safety and Employment Practices at Con Maciel Carey. My practice uh, focuses on representing employers in federal and state court actions in California. Uh, I also do a significant amount of uh, advice and counsel for employers on employment law compliance, including, uh, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, preparing policies and procedures, reviewing handbooks, conducting uh, anti-harassment or harassment prevention trainings, uh, which is becoming more uh, um, uh, an expanded requirement for employers, certainly employers in California. Uh, and then I also work on our California OSHA matters, um, handling inspections, investigations, and enforcement actions as well. Thanks, Megan. Uh, and I'll just add to that, here in Illinois, we're, we're seeing a similar uh, requirement coming on the books in 2020, uh, mandating that employers provide sexual harassment training to managers and employees. Uh, there are even additional requirements in the hospitality industry. Um, so we'll be doing a webinar in, I believe it's in February of 2020, to cover changes here in Illinois and uh, the District of Columbia. As far as today, We've got a, a full agenda. Uh, we're going to start with a review generally of what is workplace violence, what are the, the different types of, of conduct, of actions, of things that, that, that happen in the workplace that fall within that definition. Then we'll focus on 
the OSHA implications of workplace violence and, and how that agency uh, and, and various state plan agencies that enforce uh, workplace safety requirements within uh, the private sector deal with workplace violence. We'll then shift our focus to uh, employment law aspects of workplace violence, the various types of claims and liabilities that you all as employers may face uh, outside of this, the safety context, focusing some specific attention, as I said at the outset, on sexual harassment as, as workplace violence. And then we'll conclude hopefully with a number of practical and, and legal recommendations that you all can hopefully go back to your, your workplaces and begin implementing if you've not already done so, or fine tuning what, what you're currently doing to, to further protect your organizations from liability. So OSHA defines workplace violence fairly broadly. Uh, it can be any act or threat of physical violence, uh, harassment, intimidation, threatening or disruptive behavior. And you look in the right-hand column, obviously the, it can range from very serious things like assault and battery, uh, obviously an active shooter, to intangible things like bullying or or threats or intimidation. I, I think for the in many cases people think of an actual violent act, striking somebody, shooting somebody as workplace violence, but the the that intangible aspect is something that that should be focused on too. And, and in many cases those sorts of things are precursors to the more tangible forms of violence. Um, but the fact that that OSHA's definition includes harassment is 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 significant. Uh, those of us that, that work in that field often have wondered and, and questioned whether OSHA at some point would look to kind of expand uh, its jurisdiction or expand its reach and, and handle and address sexual harassment complaints. They've shown no real inclination to do that at, at, at present, although that's something that, that we continue to monitor to see if they ever do, do to look to expand uh, in, into that area of the workplace violence uh, field. So, when we look at the sources of violence or threats that your employees may face, uh, obviously their coworkers is, is in one particular source, uh, whether that's a, a disgruntled current or former employee or even a rejected job applicant. Um, whether that person has a, a formal complaint that they've aired, that they've made known to, to management, to their coworkers, or if they're, they're, they're silent and, and don't speak up, um, obviously, that's, that can be a bigger challenge. There are obviously known third parties that present, uh, can be the source of workplace violence. Um, in, in OSHA's focus tends to be on, on clients and, and customers or patrons, uh, individuals who are expected to be in the workplace that may pose a threat, whether that's um, patients in a, 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 a um, certain type of hospital, uh, a psych ward or something like that. Um, but also then we have to, certain industries you have to account for potential stranger violence. Um, so whether that's based on the location of your site, if it's in a high crime area, uh, or, or the nature of the business, such as, as late night retail, where um, you have a very light staff uh, and, and certain potentially minimal security um, standards or, or mechanisms in place to protect those people that are encountering strangers, uh, particularly late at night. A review of the, the statistics, I, I think, are, is often instructive just to give a sense of the scope of the, of the concern or the problem that employers face. Um, so when you think of nearly 20% of violent crimes are committed in the workplace, it gives an idea of the, of, of the extent of the, the the hazard or the risk that employees, your employees are facing. Um, of the workplace crimes that are committed, 21% involve some sort of weapon, most often a gun. Uh, and of the over nearly 5,000 fatalities that took place in the workplace most recently, uh, nearly 10% involve were homicides, or in other words, the, the intentional murder of another, uh, of an employee. Uh, and I think this is obviously, and it ties in with our the, the sexual harassment aspect that we're going to be talking about today. But particularly troubling is that, that the number two cause of workplace fatalities among women workers is uh, is homicide. Um, and I think obviously that ties in to a large extent on the, the potential threat of violence by spouse, 
uh, or significant other that, that, that follows that, that woman into the workplace. Uh, I handled a case a number of years ago for a, a hospital here in Chicago where and it was right around the holidays. The, a, a couple was separating, and the, um, the husband, a soon-to-be ex-husband, was disinvited from his, his wife's family's Thanksgiving, uh, and he tracked her down uh, and, and murdered her in the parking garage of the hospital. Uh, and in, in that case, uh, there was an investigation and there was some question about the sufficiency of, of the hospital's workplace violence program. But because this was not a, in a situation where there had been threats, where there had been any sort of warning signs, uh, it was not a, a failure, certainly in my view, of the hospital's program, uh, given that this happened, because there was, there was no opportunity to, to invoke or, or utilize the protections afforded by the, the hospital's program. Uh, over 2 million employees report being victims of workplace violence every year. Uh, and as, of, as you can see here, as a, as a recent survey indicated, uh, fewer than 30% of pro private employers have workplace violence prevention programs, and only 20% include training. So we, we are always big advocates, obviously, of, of developing programs. Uh, I think if it's not written down in many cases, it's certainly less likely to be addressed uh, or, or it will be viewed as by employees and managers as something that is important to an organization. Um, and even if you do have it written down, obviously, if you, if you train people on it, that demonstrates a further commitment and really drives home the point that this is something that uh, your organization views as a, as a significant issue. Uh, just a brief recap of, of a number of uh, recent events. Obviously, we could have slide after slide that, that covers and, and recounts various tragic scenarios that have taken place over the years. Uh, as you can see from this slide, the, the types of incidents where employees are killed at work really runs the gamut. Um, so you have, uh, you, many of you may have seen on the news several years ago where a, a biker gang meeting at a Twin Peaks restaurant in Waco, Texas, resulted in a, a, a massive brawl that led to nine people being killed. Um, you know, I, I, I don't whether or not someone could make the, the, the argument that uh, biker gangs meeting at a Twin Peaks restaurant is a recognized hazard is, an, is another question. Um, but certainly, I think if, if that biker gang had been meeting at that restaurant on a regular basis, uh, if they had been rowdy, if there had been incidents, you know, that, that's certainly something that, that the organization, the employer may need to consider. Uh, the Roanoke, Virginia uh, murder of a, a, a two journalists by a former coworker, uh, you know, again, just like my, my hospital uh, matter I just discussed, you know, you'd, you'd really want to look at what sort of warning, if any, any, any in indicators that this person might be violent, might be stalking uh, his coworker. The uh, a hospital in St. Cloud, Wisconsin, where a security guard was killed by a patient under psychiatric observation, certainly a, a recognized hazard within the healthcare industry. Uh, and fairly recently, in, in our own backyard here in Illinois, a tragic incident at the beginning of the year where five people were killed by a disgruntled employee uh, during his termination meeting. He was being notified that he was going to be laid off. Uh, and he brought, apparently brought a gun into the meeting and killed five uh, five people either in the meeting or, or as he as he left the meeting, including uh, a 21 year old HR intern uh, on his I believe his first day in the job, uh, a plant manager, an HR manager, and several coworkers. So I will turn it over to Lindsay to uh, continue the discussion. All right, thanks, Aaron. Uh, so now we'll spend some time just going over how OSHA treats, treats workplace violence, um, the enforcement <clears throat> focus that it does have, um, the enforcement tools that it does have and that it does use, um, and then sort of the implications of that um, and how OSHA has been using those enforcement tools from what we've seen so far. Um, so as many of you might already know, um, OSHA does not actually have a workplace violence standard. Um, there's no specific regulation that delineates what an employer's responsibilities are in the context of workplace violence. Uh, there's nothing that tells an employer exactly what they should do for training or safeguards in the workplace. Uh, but what OSHA has done to um, address the hazard of workplace violence is it has used what's known as the general duty clause, which is section 5A1 of the OSH Act. 
specifically, the general duty clause states that employers must provide employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So a very broad standard uh, that OSHA has used in many different ways to address hazards that are not specifically covered by its standards. Uh, and one of those recently, um, particularly in the context of the healthcare industry and healthcare systems, we've seen OSHA using uh, Section 5A1, this general duty clause, quite frequently um, to address the hazard of workplace violence. So to establish a violation under Section 5A1 of the OSH Act, um, OSHA has to establish four different elements. Uh, the first being that the employer failed to keep the workplace free of the particular hazard, in this case, workplace violence. Uh, second, that the hazard is recognized by the employer, and there's a few different ways that OSHA um, has been establishing that particular element, and we'll go over that a little bit in this presentation. Uh, third, that the hazard was likely to cause serious injury or death. Um, as you can see from the language directly from Section 5A1, um, it is the general duty clause is limited to those particular hazards that um, are likely to cause serious injury or death. And then finally, element four is that there is a feasible means of correcting the hazard. So that there's, OSHA has to establish that there is a feasible means to abate the particular hazard um, and a feasible means in this case of abating the hazard of workplace violence to establish a violation against a particular employer. So this slide shows um, just a general overview of how I think we skipped ahead. Yeah, right here. Um, how OSHA has addressed element number two, which is demonstrating that the hazard is recognized. Um, so there's a few ways that OSHA does that. And the first one you'll see here is through industry consensus guidance. Um, this is where a trade group or an academic body um, has put out a consensus standard or consensus document that lays out expectations for a particular industry. Um, these types of documents are often cross-referenced by OSHA in its guidance um, or in the citations that are issued to demonstrate that the employer's industry has recognized this particular hazard. And if the industry has recognized a particular hazard, then the employer should have as well. Um, one of the second ways OSHA establishes that the hazard is recognized is through the employer's own policies. Uh, and we saw this recently in the Integra decision, which we'll talk about a little bit um, a little later on in these slides. Uh, this is used often in the workplace violence arena where OSHA may come to an employer site to investigate a particular incident of workplace violence and you know, sees that there is a policy on workplace violence and maybe that policy includes statements that specific need, specifically acknowledge that workplace violence is a hazard that they are dealing with and is a hazard they're trying to address. Um, and employers' own policies generally alone are not going to be sufficient to show that this is a recognized hazard. Obviously, um, you know, OSHA's guidance makes it clear that it expects employers to have workplace violence policies in place often, particularly if they've had incidents of workplace violence. So, you know, this is a good practice and, and something that we would generally advise for employers. Um, but that is something that OSHA might look at to say, you know, the employer obviously recognized that workplace violence was a hazard. Um, and so we've met our, our burden under element two to establish a general duty clause violation. Uh, a third example, of what OSHA might use to establish that a hazard is recognized is the employer's own injury and illness data or incident reports. Um, so if OSHA comes to an employer's work site, is conducting an inspection, and observes that there have been you know, 20 recorded incidents of workplace violence in the last three years, um, then they might say, you know, your injury and illness records show that workplace violence is a problem here, that it's happening often enough that it should have been recognized by the employer as a hazard. 
Um, in the context, you know, of a hospital situation, this could include a number of patient attacks that have been recordable cases. Um, in late night retail, this could include incidents where a robbery might have occurred, um, an employee was injured in the process. Uh, so if OSHA is observing a pattern in the injury and illness data or the incident reports that they review pursuant to an inspection, uh, they might say that this is sufficient to show that the employer should have recognized this hazard in their workplace. And then the last one is OSHA's own guidance. Um, so OSHA has established specific guidance for workplace violence, um, particularly in certain industries where OSHA has asserted that incidents of workplace violence are higher. Uh, we've already talked about the, the, a little bit about the healthcare industry. That's one industry where OSHA has put out specific guidance addressing workplace violence. Uh, another is late night retail where they have put out specific, a specific guidance document addressing workplace violence and the expectations they have for that particular industry. Um, so that is another source that OSHA might point to to say, you know, we've put out this guidance, we've let you know that um, based on the data that we've seen and our observations that this is a recognized hazard in your industry. So the expectation is um, that you would have developed a workplace violence program and training to go along with that. Um, so they might also use that guidance to establish that the hazard is recognized in a particular industry. And they have been, you know, from what we've seen in the enforcement efforts that have, um, that have occurred under the general duty clause, OSHA does generally rely on these guidance documents in establishing the citation and often the abatement efforts. Um, and this is easier than relying on a specific standard to do so. Um, because, you know, just producing a guidance document doesn't require any notice or comment. Uh, like the rulemaking process generally does, uh, or, or always does. Whenever OSHA wants to promulgate a new rule, they do have to go through notice and comment rulemaking, which they don't have to do for guidance. Um, and then there's also no required economic feasibility analysis, so it's much easier to put out a guidance document that they can then rely on in enforcement than uh, promulgating a specific rule on workplace violence. OSHA has expressed publicly through its guidance documents uh, that the hazard of workplace violence is well recognized. And um, again, the industries where it's established that it's well recognized is healthcare, late night retail, and it's also recognized um, for taxi drivers. Uh, the hazard is less recognized in other industries, and that might be because it is less of a hazard in, under, in other industries. Um, but that doesn't mean that OSHA can't still apply the general duty clause um, in the context of other industries. So even if an employer is outside these specific industries where OSHA has been putting out guidance, um, there may be enough data on OSHA's own website um, you know, that, that employers have access to to say that a hazard should have been recognized in a particular industry or again, OSHA might depend on the employer's own policies and injury and illness records to say that um, the hazard of workplace violence should have been recognized by the employer even though their particular industry has not been highlighted by OSHA in its guidance documents. So I mentioned the Integra case uh, a little bit earlier, and this is a case that was decided by the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission back in the spring of 2019. Um, and it's a significant case because, um, you know, there has been a lot of question around whether it is appropriate for OSHA to rely on the general duty clause in the context of workplace violence to um, address that particular hazard. And in this case, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission determined that it was appropriate for OSHA to use the general duty clause to cite the employer in this case and went through a couple of the elements in um, particular detail to establish how they would evaluate whether OSHA is meeting the elements of a general duty clause violation. Uh, so as a little bit of background on this case, 
Uh, Integra was sending social workers to client homes to identify health care needs and serve health care needs. Um, and in this context, a particular social worker went to a client's home and the client attacked that social worker and ended up killing them. Um, at the time of that incident, there, the uh, company was not using background checks on their clients. And in this particular case, there had been some earlier uh, violent interactions from this particular client, and then that ultimately resulted, um, you know, at a later point, another violent interaction resulted in the employee's death. So OSHA did cite this employer under the general duty clause for a workplace violence incident, and the commission upheld that violation um, mainly because they found that there was a recognized hazard here. The employer had work rules and policies in place addressing workplace violence uh, and the specific issues that they were aware of related to their particular employees and the clients. Uh, they also provided training to address workplace violence. Um, they had policies that called for obtaining certain history of um, clients from the family and community. So, and then they also uh, were using a buddy system at the time um, that you know didn't prove effective in this case, but that was in place. And so OSHA considered all that together, as well as the fact that this was something that occurred within you know, the, the healthcare industry, an industry that um, OSHA had already recognized as being um, one vulnerable to incidents of workplace violence, to say that there was a hazard here and that the employer should have recognized that hazard. Uh, another significant uh, element for the review commission was the last element, which is whether there were feasible means of abatement that could have had a material reduction in the likelihood of workplace violence occurring. And here, uh, based on expert testimony, the commission found that there were things that the employer could have put in place that would have had a material effect, a material reduction on the likelihood of this workplace violence, violence incident occurring. So as I said, um, OSHA has put out some guidance documents for certain types of industries where it's recognized that uh, workplace violence is a significant issue and more significant in those industries than others. Um, and one industry, again, is the late night retail industry. And guidance in this sector was developed because of the prevalence of workplace violence that uh, OSHA was seeing at the time. Um, around the time that it put out this guidance, OSHA determined uh, that more than 25% of workplace homicides occurred in retail, uh, and almost half of those took place at convenience stores, gas stations, and liquor stores, uh, which are open late into the night um, and often only staffed by one or two people. Uh, the guidance identifies unique workplace violence factors for late night retailers that um, OSHA has determined make it more likely that they are going to have incidents of workplace violence. Uh, some of those factors include, as, as I already mentioned, um, solo staffing or only a couple people being on staff uh, late into the night. And then the fact that these like gas stations uh, and convenience stores sometimes tend to be in more isolated areas. Uh, poorly lit parking lots, um, and then also that these types of establishments sell things like alcohol and, you know, involve the exchange of money, which that makes them more obvious targets for uh, robberies. And that's, that's where uh, OSHA was seeing a lot of these workplace violence incidents occurring. Uh, so to address the hazard in this industry, uh, OSHA starts from the recommendation that late night retailers do need to develop a clear workplace violence prevention program. Uh, and as part of that program, recommends that employers do perform workplace security analysis and review the conditions at the work site, such as, you know, lighting of the store or the parking lot, um, maybe putting additional staff on, 
uh, and assessing the work tasks to, um, to assess the likelihood of a violent event. OSHA also recommends in this context that, uh, that retailers evaluate security measures such as you know, whether it would uh, reduce the likelihood of a workplace violence incident to install cameras, uh, having emergency procedures in place that employees can use in an emergency incident like a robbery. Um, and then you'll see when, when we get into the next slide that this analysis uh, is very similar to the type that was conducted in the context of the healthcare industry as to what steps should be taken in that industry as well. So OSHA has also developed non-mandatory guidance for the healthcare industry. Um, that was put out, the most recent version at least, was put out in April 2015. Uh, they were, do refer to it as non-mandatory guidance, but um, I can say from experience that this guidance is heavily relied on in OSHA's enforcement efforts related to workplace violence incidents in the healthcare industry. Um, OSHA is very interested in workplace violence hazard in this particular industry because, as it states in its guidance, around 70% of known workplace assaults have occurred in the healthcare setting. Um, this isn't necessarily unexpected or surprising because of the fact that this is an environment where there is a lot of third-party involvement. Uh, Aaron talked about that a little bit earlier in the presentation. You know, there's patients, visitors, and vendors um, who are interacting with the employee population. And in these settings, uh, employees are often dealing with patient populations that have mental health issues and are being treated for mental health issues which raises the likelihood of a workplace violence incident occurring. Um, prison systems also often use healthcare facilities to meet the healthcare needs of their prisoners. And so again, this is another circumstance that can raise the likelihood of a workplace violence incident. Uh, the guidance put out in 2015 uh, was there was already guidance in place, so this just sort of updated the prior guidance that OSHA had been relying on uh, and had been providing to the industry. Uh, but it did include risk factors and tasks and locations and activities in the healthcare industry that OSHA thought were going to be more susceptible to a workplace violence incident. So this slide just addresses um, that guidance in a little bit more detail. Uh, some of the recommendations that OSHA provides in that guidance is that employers create a zero tolerance workplace violence prevention program and that uh, they provide significant training on that program to any employees who might have a need to understand the program and its requirements. As part of the effectiveness of responding to an incident of workplace violence, uh, OSHA also recommends that healthcare facilities ensure that they have an adequate number of security personnel and that, they are, that, that, pers that those personnel are trained on recognizing signs of escalating behavior and how to effectively de-escalate these situations. Uh, they also recommend patient screening to identify patients who might be more likely to engage and workplace violence, such as those dealing with mental health issues, uh, and then also identifying and keeping good records about patients who, are, who, who have shown a propensity for violence, who maybe have had violent incidents in the past, so that employees are aware of this when they're interacting with those particular individuals. Um, it also discusses different engineering and administrative controls that can be used in this setting, such as cameras or panic buttons, um, and minimizing the amount of employees that work alone or secluded areas of a workplace. So some of these more general um, administrative and engineering controls and some of the more general recommendations, um, you know, this is in the context of the healthcare industry, but could certainly be applied in other settings where there is concern of potential workplace violence incidents. And then one area where we've seen some recent change and some recent development is in the lodging industry. And this is 
something that's occurring even outside of the OSHA context. Um, there have been state and local governments that have adopted the use of panic buttons for housekeeping staff. Uh, specifically, we've seen Chicago, uh, Sacramento and Long Beach, and Miami Beach all adopt panic button ordinances so that housekeeping staff are required to use panic buttons. Um, and this, you know, some of the impetus for this has been, at least in Chicago, um, you know, they're finding that 58% of hotel workers in Chicago have reported being sexually harassed. Um, so this is a concern for that particular industry, specifically in those areas, um, and they have addressed it through the use of panic buttons. Panic buttons, uh, we talked about them, or I mentioned them in the context of the healthcare industry too. Um, this is something that has been relied on as one tactic to make sure there is an immediate response to an incident or potential incident of workplace violence, and the use of panic bus buttons we've also seen be included in collective bargaining agreements as well. And then also um, some hotels have decided to voluntarily adopt the use of them um, to address these types of incidents. So is OSHA progressing on a workplace violence standard? Uh, back in the summer of 2016, there was a real push for OSHA to take some steps in developing its own standard. Uh, and in December 2016, OSHA did issue a request for information or, or an RFI um, to get information from industry and from you know, those interested in this issue like AFL-CIO and different nurses associations. Uh, collect information on them about the development of a workplace violence standard. Those responses were due back in April 2017. Um, and then on the last day uh, that uh, Assistant Secretary of La Labor, former Se Assistant Secretary of Labor, um, David Michaels had an office, uh, OSHA did grant the petition to begin its work on a workplace violence rule. So at this point, uh, the rule is on the fall 2019 regulatory agenda at the pre-rule stage. Uh, there is a projected date in the regulatory agenda of January 2020 to initiate the SABRIFA process, which would be the next step in development of this rule. Um, but there have been prior projected dates for the initiation of this process, so it remains to be seen if uh, OSHA will progress to that next step in the rulemaking process but they are getting pressure from Congress as well. So back in November uh, of this year, Congress did pass a law, H.R. 1309, also known as the Workplace Violence Prevention for Healthcare and Social Service Workers Act, uh, which would require OSHA to implement an interim final rule uh, on workplace violence in the healthcare setting within one year and then would require OSHA to issue a final standard within 42 months. Um, so this law has only passed the House so far. Uh, it would have to pass the Senate as well. Um, but if it does pass, which we could see, um, I think it's probably not likely to pass through the Senate currently, um, but depending on how the 2020 election goes and if this law sort of you know, stays uh, at the forefront, then we could see it pass. Um, depending, again, on, on those results in 2020. And if so, this would certainly move the rulemaking process along much faster than it would generally be uh, under the normal standards used for rulemaking. So I'll pass it over to Megan to briefly address uh, the workplace violence standard in California. Thanks, Lindsay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in contrast, excuse me, in contrast uh, with uh, the federal level, California has uh, taken up the issue of adding specific workplace violence standards, and they are a little bit further along in the process. Uh, taking just a quick step backwards, historically, Cal, Cal OSHA has cited employers for workplace violence issues under California's Injury and Illness Prevention Program rule. Uh, and so that's how they handled it uh, historically. And then in 2017, Cal OSHA promulgated a specific rule for the healthcare industry 
And this applied uh, to healthcare uh, facilities, home health care facilities, some drug treatment uh, programs, uh, emergency uh, medical providers, uh, some outpatient medical service providers, um, specifically those providing services to correctional and detention settings. Uh, so that's again a nod to, or a recognition of the fact that uh, some of those higher risk patients uh, may need additional, uh, th that employers may need to pay particular attention when it comes to those uh, patients. So the, the specific rule that uh, is currently in existence for the healthcare industry has uh, requirements that are actually very similar to the injury and illness prevention program rule. They're just in the workplace violence context. And so that needs to be considered uh, when formulating uh, your plan and meeting those requirements. And I'll talk a little bit more about the specific requirements in a moment because California OSHA introduced has, has now introduced a draft rule that would apply for general industry. So it would apply across the board, not just for healthcare providers. And uh, we're in the rulemaking process for this, uh, for this general industry rule. There was uh, an original draft introduced in 2017, late 2017 with a revised draft introduced in October of 2018. Uh, it incorporates uh, most of the provisions of the Injury and Illness Prevention Program rule. So it incorporates things, uh, requirements such as having a written plan, identifying the risk factors, having a training aspect, having an anti-retaliation provision so that people who bring concerns forward or participate in an investigation cannot be retaliated against for that participation. It also requires keeping logs so that when, uh, when an employer has multiple incidents, there's a way of keeping track, having good record keeping, keeping those records for a certain amount of time so that adjustments can be made if necessary uh, to the plan and so that employees who may be affected by past incidents can be aware of it and keep that in mind going forward. There's also certain reporting requirements where uh, there is, you know, a particular situation where for where use of force is being uh, is happening, or there are other uh, high risk uh, situations. Um, particularly, reporting requirements are going to be triggered when there is use of, use of a gun uh, or other, like I said, high high risk situations. Um, so that that can be part of the record keeping and uh, adjustment of the program. So they uh, were, we, it remains to be seen whether there will be further revisions to the general industry rule or whether it will be adopted in its current form. We will certainly keep an eye out and, uh, and provide update once there's a final rule in place. Um, especially with respect to when it goes into effect and when all of these requirements uh, begin to take effect. I think at this point, we're passing on to Erin to transition us into the employment context. Thank you, Megan. And uh, I, I think it's particularly interesting, and, and we certainly, as Megan said, pay close attention to developments in, in, in Cal OSHA. Uh, we've, we've seen uh, that's the California lead the way on heat illness, uh, beginning with with uh, outside work requirements and, and adding uh, inside heat heat illness protection requirements. Uh, so, it's, is it likely uh, or even possible that we'll see something similar on on the federal side? I, I think, as Lindsay talked about, that certainly the on the healthcare side, I, I think it's highly unlikely that we'll see a general industry workplace violence. But at the same time, for those of you that uh, want want to be ahead of the curve and view workplace violence prevention as something that per, is particularly important, uh, certainly looking to the, the, the regulations and the requirements that are imposed in, on general industry in California would be one, one a great place to start as far as a model. 
Um, so assuming that we've now addressed and, and mitigated all your concerns from an OSHA standpoint uh, with respect to workplace violence, let's, we'll turn our attention to employment law. Uh, and, and here now one of the probably most important considerations is that we're not really dealing with a government uh, regulator uh, that it's going to be inspecting or auditing your workplace, but now we're dealing with private plaintiff's lawyers who uh, may be more aggressive or more creative, and certainly in, in, in coming up with claims to bring against you uh, if, if their client is, is something befalls their client in your workplace. So looking at the different types of liability, the potential liabilities that you can face as an employer. Uh, first, obviously, uh, potential claims or liabilities to both your employees uh, as well as third parties. So uh, we've, we've covered in depth the, the potential for claims or, or inspections and citations under the general duty clause. Uh, but then you also have the potential for negligent hiring claims uh, should someone in your employee uh, harm, uh, do violence to either a an, an coworker uh, or to a third party, a member of the public with whom they come in contact in the course of doing their job. Um, similarly, you can have a negligent supervision or retention claim, uh, so that, that would be differ from a negligent hiring claim because there it's, it's likely going to be something that, that that person did or said during their employment that should give rise to concerns or, or a duty to investigate on your part, uh, a failure to do that you continue employing the, the person and then they commit an, an act of violence against a coworker or against a, a third party member of the public. You also have potential liability with respect to the, the victim uh, of, it, of violence in your workplace. Um, that can be, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, uh, violations of your harassment free workplace policy. Uh, in the event that your employee is, is injured or needs leave to, to deal with that injury or to deal with the emotional trauma that surrounds the workplace violence, uh, failing to provide that leave can be a, a lead to an FMLA interference claim or retaliating against that person uh, in any, any form of whether it's a tangible harm employment action such as a demotion, a, a discharge, a reduction in pay, or even some lesser uh, impact such as, as loss of key accounts or, or a less desirable ter sales territory or something like that can all lead to retaliation claims. Uh, and obviously also the, the, the employee who brings forth a concern uh, or about workplace violence, whether that's an actual act of violence or they feel threatened, uh, should, should action be taken against them. They may bring forth a retaliation or whistleblower claim. I recently defended a client uh, involving a, an 11C claim under the OSH Act, uh, where an individual had been involved in an altercation in the workplace. Of course, he claimed that the other employee was the, was the aggressor. The other employee pointed the finger at, at the individual who, who later brought the OSH claim. Uh, but long story short, they, they were brought into the office. They were counseled about this incident. Uh, several weeks later, the, this individual was terminated for another policy violation and then came forward with an 11C retaliation claim saying that the reason that he was let go was because he engaged in a protected activity and opposing workplace violence. So even if when you're doing your due diligence prior to a termination, uh, someone who has brought forth concerns about workplace violence uh, it, it's not enough to consider, are, you know, are they in the protected age group? Uh, are they, uh, have they complained about sexual harassment? Are they disabled or whatever analysis you go through in assessing risk prior to a termination? Uh, this is another question. Uh, have, they, have they complained about workplace violence? If so, that is a protected activity. At least OSHA will view it that way. Uh, and then last but not least, don't forget that you, there's potential liability to the employee who's accused. Um, will uh, does the person have some sort of um, mental condition, uh, a disability, where they're going to claim that they need a, a accommodation, or that they're being they're perceived as being as disabled because of the, their conduct? Uh, one of the changes that we'll be talking about in the Illinois uh, law webinar early in 2020 is that the Illinois Human Rights Act has been expanded to protect perceived status. So even if someone is not disabled, but that that perception status extends now to any type of, of protected status, so perceived sexual orientation, perceived race, perceived religion. Um, but here, 
be mindful of the fact that, that there are also potential privacy claims uh, if someone does have medical information or, or, or condition that they've disclosed to the company. Uh, and as well, of course, they're always, the always concerning defamation claim, uh, if, if something is shared beyond the, the scope or the group of people who have a right or a need to know about that person's condition or their conduct, um, it, it very well could lead to a defamation claim. With respect to, and as, as I said at the beginning of the program, that we were going to spend a little, some time focusing on the impact of the Me Too movement and, and the, the light that it has shown once again on sexual harassment. Um, and again, as now that we're seeing this this kind of crossover between uh, and focus on on sexual assault and sexual violence, in addition to uh, the more commonplace comments or or less serious conduct, it's it's important to to understand why this this from a legal perspective why this risk is greater for employers. Uh, in fiscal year 2018, uh, there were 7,609 charges filed with the EEOC alleging sexual harassment, which is a 12% increase over the prior fiscal year. Uh, that does not include the number of charges filed with state and local uh, agencies, so whether it's the Department of Human Rights here in Illinois or the, or the City uh, Human Rights Commission here in Chicago, um, it, it, that's a significant uptick. Uh, the EEOC, in, in particularly Serious cases are ones where they feel there's a systemic issue or, or, or a point to be made. The EEOC will file a lawsuit on behalf of the charging party. Uh, six, they filed 66 such lawsuits in fiscal year 2018, uh, 41 of which include allegations of sexual harassment, which is a 50% increase over the, the prior year. Uh, and certainly, last not least, it, the agency recovered nearly $70 million for victims of sexual harassment through litigation and administrative uh, enforcement, which is up from uh, just under $50 million. So knowing the EEOC is paying particularly close attention to this issue, uh, if you receive a charge um, that in the past perhaps the EEOC would, would quickly process and dismiss, as, as is often the case with that agency, at least the charges that I handle, um, the EEOC rarely pays uh, pays much mind to most of the charges and provided that you can submit a position statement that uh, ably and effectively explains why the claims were, were uh, are not well stated or not well founded uh, in the past we've always we've, we've seen those charges regularly dismissed and I think you need to be particularly attuned and concerned if you see charges that are coming in from um, multiple charges from one site number of charges uh, all implicating the same manager or, or group of managers, um, or just something that indicates that there's a systemic problem at a site, you should expect that somebody at the EEOC is likely going to start paying more attention to that, and that that could be a, a matter that is, is flagged for uh, aggressive or, or focused follow-up. As part of the EEOC's continued and, and, and enhanced focus on sexual harassment, uh, the agency convened a select task force in 2016 uh, that issued a number of findings and recommendations. Uh, some of this is probably be filed under the uh, no big surprise uh, category in that the agency found first that harassment remains a persistent problem that too often goes unreported. Um, statistics that, that are reviewed time and time again all seem to indicate the same thing that it, it, there's a small percentage of, of the people that are actually report uh, feeling harassed, uh, particularly sexually harassed, actually come forward to say anything, even internally, uh, to the harasser or to human resources, let alone to, to go outside the workplace and file a, a charge with, with the EEOC or a state agency. Uh, and as you can see, one of the, one of the findings uh, is that the, the least common response to harassment is to take formal action. Um, so. I think often that suggests that, that if you're getting formal complaints, that could be indicative of, uh, you know, sort of like the, the tip of the iceberg that's, that's above the water, that there's a bigger problem beneath that, that, that merits probing in, into an issue. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I had a client come to me, uh, human resources professionals sharing uh, that they had heard uh, 
what they called water cooler talk, that, that there were whispers in the workplace, that there was, uh, there was a manager or two that were, were really uh, engaging in some, some, some highly problematic behavior, but no one had come forward uh, to formally complain, not even, not even to managers. It was just somehow it just bubbled up to, to someone in human resources. And the question was, you know, should we do anything since no one has come forward to, to complain? Um, obviously, or as, as I hope you would expect, my advice to that client was absolutely, if, if it's however it's reached you, whether it's a formal complaint or, or just kind of whispers and gossip, uh, that's putting the company on notice. And in that case, we, we did launch a, an investigation and what we found was, was quite troubling and, and fairly widespread. So it was one of those situations uh, where it was certainly uh, very beneficial that the investigation was launched when it was um, because they were able to, to head that off before it became a bigger problem. Uh, and, and I think it goes without saying also that, uh, as you see in the second uh, kind of inset box here, that there is a compelling business case for stopping harassment. Um, putting aside uh, the, the, I think, often recognized impact that it can have on, your, on productivity, workers who, are, who feel that they're being harassed, um, whether sexually harassed or, or harassed because of their membership in any other protected class, are, are likely going to not do as good a job. Uh, they're going to be less productive. Um, whether whether or not that is um, uh, be, because of uh, whether that's as a server at, at a restaurant they're they're uh, struggling to, to to focus on the customer or if they're working on an assembly line that they're they're not able to 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 focus on attention to detail, detail they're missing errors things like that. Uh, another finding of the commission of the select task force and one that I think is is particularly important is that leadership and accountability are critical. Um, I, I know when I give harassment training to managers, if, if the division president or the CEO or, or some high, high senior member of leadership is present, introduces the program, uh, emphasizes the importance of compliance to the managers, generally they're going to sit up and take notice, uh, hopefully a little bit more than they might have if it's just um, you know, it's just kind of something where I, I walk in and, and, and whether I'm introduced or not, but it's someone that, and that person ideally stay in there uh, and, and model the, 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 the appropriate behavior and, and, and level of concern about this issue. Um, that aside, uh, in addition to corp kind of leader buy-in from the top, uh, just making sure that, that the culture that is created is, is one of respect um, and, and one that does not tolerate that sort of behavior, uh, those the, the managers, whether it's frontline or, or the next level up, all need to model that appropriate behavior uh, and, and step in when, when things happen that are, are not acceptable. Uh, if, if employees and lower level managers are not seeing it from the top, they're certainly not going to model that behavior or engage in the appropriate behavior. It's certainly less likely. Uh, and then last but not least, and I think from, from, uh, from our perspective, probably one of the most significant conclusions that the task force reached uh, was that training needs to change. Uh, and, and specifically, uh, what the EEOC found that training tends to be too focused on avoiding legal liability. What are the legal definitions? Um, certainly, I think those, those of us, those lawyers among us who have given these training programs, uh, many that it's that has been a focus of the training and what the EEOC found and recommends is that training should be um, focused more on civility uh, promoting respect uh, within the workplace uh, the idea being that if people are respectful to each other uh, and that becomes the culture that then the sort of disrespectful behavior uh, the name calling the insults and the insults that could then get tied to someone's national origin, someone's gender, someone's appearance, are less likely to take place. So back to uh, the, the I, I talked about this a few slides back uh, as far as, as other potential liability that employers can face. Uh, so, so to the extent, and we, when we're looking at the duty that you may owe to your employees and to third parties, I mean, obviously, for the most part, um, you don't have the, a duty or an obligation to control or, or direct some, um, somebody else's conduct, another person's conduct, absent a special relationship, so uh, an agency relationship such as with a supervisor. 
Um, and so when you do have, if you have someone who is performing tasks in the course of their duty, uh, then obviously that's where the liability can attach. Um, so particularly we see this in, in um, situations where a, a company employs, say, uh, delivery people, uh, installers, someone who's going into somebody's house, uh, somebody who has contact with the, the general public. Um, in those cases, you have the potential for liability to the general public and to others beyond what you might normally have in a number of other uh, employment contexts. I also mentioned earlier the potential for a negligent hiring claim. Uh, this, this can often come up in, uh, in the context where if an employer is not doing background checks uh, and, and is hiring someone uh, who, who has a, a criminal background, one that could, could suggest or indicate that they are a risk to engaging in certain types of behavior. Um, obviously, with one of the things that you, you do need to consider when you're conducting background checks uh, is to, in the administration of your background check program, uh, and you'll probably hear this from, 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 uh, from us in, in a number of different contexts and different webinars and presentations, uh, you need to evaluate the information that you obtain uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, and you should not simply necessarily disqualify someone based on your initial findings. Um, this is, of course, putting aside uh, the, Fa the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the technical obligations and requirements that are attached there uh, with respect to, to using the appropriate authorization and disclosure forms, uh, to providing a pre-adverse action notice and, and things along those lines. But once you get that information and you're evaluating it, um, giving it, the recommendation would be to typically give the person an opportunity to explain uh, the, the, the findings uh, to the extent there were convictions and then and, and looking at whether the conviction uh, is job related, uh, whether it's something that impacts their ability to do their job or would suggest that they pose a risk uh, but looking also at how long ago did it take place, what have they done since then. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've often looked, looked at these issues as just kind of taking a rational or, or reasonable approach. Um, the more serious the crime, the more directly related to the job, um, certainly the, the, the greater the employer's ability will be to, to rely on that in deciding not to hire the person. Um, obviously, if, if you're, you're considering someone for a, a home uh, appliance or, or uh, furniture delivery, and they're going to, and they have a, 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 an assault, uh, sexual assault, or, or some sort of a kidnapping or something like that, uh, there would not be, in my view, any question that, that you'd be well within your rights in not hiring that person uh, if they had a. In their mid 40s or so, had some uh, years old in college. You know that that then it gets to be perhaps a, a tougher call. You'd probably still be within your rights in, in not hiring that person, but it's certainly something uh, that you'd want to take a, take a closer look at. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk with a, a, a regional attorney for the EEOC a couple of years ago about their approach to these questions, and uh, and he he told me basically that look, as long as the employer is going through that case by case analysis. Um, if they if they err on the side of of over being over uh, aggressive in their enforcement uh, of or or just reliance on a background uh, or a conviction, uh, we're likely not going to do anything. It's it's the employers that simply adopt an across the board rule and and, and refuse to to even evaluate or, or decline to consider any any explanations or considerations. Uh, then there's also uh, in, closely related to a negligent hiring claim would be negligent supervision or retention. And as, as I said before, uh, this is something where the em employer learns of things during the person's employment, so not, not behavior that they engaged in before they were hired, uh, but things that they did while working for the employer that would suggest that they may pose uh, a, a risk to either their coworkers uh, or the general public. And so the, the courts will look at and ask questions, did the employer exercise ordinary care in supervising this employee? Um, and, and if so, in other words, should the employer have known uh, or were they generally put on, on knowledge, given, given a heads up in essence that this person could pose a hazard uh, and, and were they negligent in failing to address it? 
Uh, there was a case uh, here in Illinois several a few years back uh, involving a manager at a, a big box home improvement store who had taken uh, a particular interest in a female subordinate, uh, and she, she reported concerns that, that he was acting uh, in a manner that, that gave her serious concern and that he may be stalking her. Uh, ultimately, in his a, a terribly tragic case, he ended up kidnapping and, and murdering her. Um, and and I, the, the signs, looking back on it, were certainly there that, that given his behavior, the, this company should have been uh, been on notice uh, of the threat that he posed. So it's one of those things, uh, certainly the recommendation is if someone's coming forward, uh, even if you may not, you think that they're, they're being uh, alarmist or, or overly concerned, uh, certainly it's something that needs to be addressed and, and evaluated and looked into and documented. Uh, and then last but not least, I, I referenced this a few slides back, um, certainly uh, one best practice would be to engage in uh, and utilize background checks as part of your hiring and sometimes even as part of, of your promotion process. Uh, in addition to the concerns I mentioned earlier uh, with respect to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, you do have to, there, there are state laws uh, so here in Illinois, Wisconsin, and a number of other states that distinguish between arrests and convictions. So you, you, while you can rely on convictions here in Illinois, uh, you are the statute specifically prohibits the use the mere fact of an arrest now in certain in certain egregious circumstances uh, you know someone who is arrested for uh, a heinous crime or one that it, that involves notoriety and it's reported in 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 the newspapers or on the news uh, one thing we'll, we'll often do is is encourage the, the employer to try to gather as much other information about the the, the arrest or conviction. Uh, if that's obtaining a copy of the police report, there's a sworn affidavit from a, a police officer re regarding what, what they learned as part of their investigation leading to the arrest. Uh, that is something that an employer could rely on in declining to hire someone uh, so they're not relying solely on the arrest. Uh, there, you also need to concern yourself with the potential for disparate impact claims. Uh, if, you are, if, if reliance on criminal background may have a disparate impact on one group versus another, uh, you have to certainly make sure uh, that you're tracking all the, the explosion of the ban the box laws across this country from a number of states that have adopted these laws, as well as cities and counties. Uh, make sure that your employment application has been updated appropriately, and that many employers then have moved this process or this question uh, to the, the post um, post interview stage when you're preparing to make an offer, simply because. Uh, some some clients have found that the, the application has just gotten too many little ex disclaimers for the different states uh, that, that may not per may not allow that question on the application. So with that, I will go over to Megan to uh, talk about recommendations and strategies. Great, thanks, Aaron. So as Aaron mentioned, we'll spend the next little chunk of time discussing uh, some of the steps that employers can take to address the risks of workplace violence and sexual harassment in your workplace, as we've discussed today. A key step is to have a really clear anti-harassment policy. And this is really a tool, as Erin mentioned earlier, if you put something in writing, and then you train employees on it. It shows a real commitment to addressing the issue, and it's an incredibly effective communication tool to, to communicate the expectations around prevention of harassment. So you wanna make sure that employees are receiving a copy of the, of the policy because it doesn't do any good to have it written down if you don't know that every single employee it's actually has an opportunity to review and understand it. So it can be part of onboarding, it can be part of uh, a handbook, and it can also be part of, uh, it can just be issued as a standalone policy. Sometimes we do have uh, clients who get, can get sometimes bogged down in reviewing a, an entire handbook because that can be quite a chore, um, but don't let that stop you from issuing a, a standalone or revising a standalone uh, harassment policy and getting it out to the employees 
if you feel yours needs updating or you feel that the employees could uh, use from periodic review of it uh, or to be reminded that it exists and have an opportunity to review it uh, with some regularity on an annual uh, basis or something like that. Uh, the policy is really going uh, to best serve the, the purpose when it's really clear and easy to understand. Lawyers sometimes like to, you know, throw in a uh, language that is tied to the legal standard and can be difficult to understand, but it's really important that it just is in clear, simple language, provides examples of what harassment is um, so that people can understand it in the context of their work environment. Uh, it's also important that the policy uh, address how incidents of harassment should be reported, a little bit about what the investigation process will look like, and uh, the discipline that, that can come out of it. So it's important that people understand um, that there's a real process here, that complaints should be reported in a certain way, that an investigation will be uh, conducted and kind of what that looks like, and then ultimately that violations of the policy can result in discipline uh, up to and including termination even. Uh, it's good to put employees on notice that this is that this can have that that impact on on the workplace. The policy should have clear protection against retaliation, not only for people reporting harassment, but also from participating in an investigation. You can sometimes have people who are afraid to, you know, come in for a witness interview, that they're concerned that they're part of the investigation and that they will have negative consequences for participating. So it's important that the anti-retaliation piece of your, of your anti-harassment policy address both aspects of the potential for retaliation. And another note is, uh, as I mentioned, discipline can result from violations and discipline can, can cover a range, can look like different things. It doesn't always, a policy violation may not always warrant termination. So we do caution against using a black and white zero tolerance policy because there are instances where uh, even a violation of the harassment may not, may not justify full termination and you want the discipline to be proportionate to the offense. So those are things to keep in mind uh, when reviewing your policy and seeing if it's time for a revision. <clears throat> Another thing to keep in mind is that harassment claims are not limited by the work location or even the work hours, and that claims can arise off hours away from work, um, even in a situation that you might not think from the top of your mind that it involves work. But situations like certainly an annual holiday party or work travel to a, a conference a company off-site meeting, or even, you know, a late night happy hour that is happening informally amongst coworkers can certainly lead to a viable harassment claim. And the harassing behavior itself can also range in those situations from the most extreme situation like a sexual assault or a homicide to something like unwanted text messages from a coworker uh, after a night of drinking. And the, the reason that we bring this up is because, you know, if there, if there are situations that kind of bubble up through, through you know, water cooler talk or, or that you hear of, of something, you want these things to kind of raise that red flag in your mind so you can um, take the next step if, if, if necessary. So we recognize that try as we might, we, a company can't always control everything that happens with its workforce. So it's good to know when exactly can a company be liable for harassment. And a company is going to be liable for harassment by a supervisor or other employee in a management capacity. Uh, and there is a, a, a limited defense that can apply where the employer exercised reasonable care to prevent and promptly correct the harassment. 
but the employee unreasonably failed to take advantage of those opportunities. And this uh, defense just highlights the real importance of having a good policy against harassment and having multiple avenues for reporting so that you can say, you know, that there were multiple ways an employee could have brought this to the employer's attention, but that they really didn't um, didn't say anything. They really didn't report. They didn't mention it to anybody. Um, and they didn't take advantage of any of those opportunities to put the company on notice so that the company could address the behavior. Sometimes during these trainings, I default uh, to mentioning the employees over and over and over again, but uh, we've mentioned multiple times today that the company is, uh, companies can be liable for harassment by non-supervisors and third parties as well, um, but the standard's slightly different. So management has to have known or should have known about the harassment and failed to do anything about it. And this, of course, highlights the real importance of um, the fact that you know, complaints, people may sometimes say, I want, I want to say something off the record or I want to make an informal complaint. These things really can't be kept secret. They really can't be swept under the rug and with the hopes that nothing comes of it. Because if the company should have known because they were aware of some of this information, some of these uh, rumors or, or information that bubbled up in a, in a seemingly less formal manner, uh, they will, there will be potential liability for that, and, and the company will want to investigate right away. Uh, and it's also really important to, to empower your employees and empower people in general to not condone or ignore the harassment and to have the, and to have the ability to tell an offending person to stop the behavior because the ultimate goal is to stop and prevent this sort of behavior from continuing. A couple more notes on the complaint procedure. Uh, it's important that the complaint procedure lay out uh, who, to, who to inform, what to tell them, when to do it, how the report is, uh, is completed. Uh, employees who are, certainly employees who are harassed uh, should know to, to bring the coward, but also any employee who witnesses harassment or problematic behavior should certainly feel empowered to come forward through the complaint procedure. And you want to have multiple avenues for reporting uh, and common people to report to our uh, employees own manager, supervisor, certainly HR and top executives, um, and really anyone in a management capacity who an employee feels comfortable bringing the complaint to. And the reason why you don't want to have a single avenue for reporting is that if an employee were ever in a position where they're complaining about the person that they're supposed to report to, then that complaint may never come forward. And it's really critical to have multiple avenues. Another helpful way to uh, encourage reports to come forward is to offer multiple ways to make the report in the first place. Uh, you can specifically mention in the policy that complaints can be made in person. You can send a letter or an email, and some employers even set up uh, ways to report anonymously, whether through a hotline or a, a suggestion box or other avenues. Uh, the report you really want it to happen right away. Uh, you want it to happen right away so you make sure you address the behavior right away, but you also want to be able to investigate immediately. And as time goes on, people's memories fade, and it's important to be able to speak to witnesses as quickly as possible after an incident arises. And managers in particular should feel a, a real responsibility to take immediate action uh, to address the harassment if they receive a complaint or if they hear of anything that um, suggests problematic behavior. Now, we've, we've kind of briefly touched on the concept of bystander liability, and this is where you can have a harassment claim based on a coworker witnessing inappropriate behavior, even if it's not directed at that person. 
Um, and we certainly want to be aware of that kind of liability, but we also just from a culture perspective, we want to have people who may be witnessing uh, problematic behavior feeling empowered to intervene and that they're not just um, going to ignore behavior that they might witness um, and, and pretend that it's not their problem. We really want by stand, really want employees to be able to recognize problematic behavior and to know what to do about it. We get a lot of questions. Okay, so if I see, you know, a, a vendor come in and say something inappropriate, what am I supposed to do? So teach employees how to, how to intervene, what to say, what resources they can pull from in knowing what to do in these sorts of situations. And again, this kind of organizational culture and a culture of standing up for, for those around us and saying something starts from the top and it's reinforced throughout the entire company. And there are really good opportunities um, to teach these, certainly the harassment training that is required by cert in certain jurisdictions. It's an amazing opportunity to teach these things. And you can do training even if it's not uh, strictly required. A little bit more about the investigation itself. Uh, again, employers should establish a procedure to investigate all complaints of harassment. And the goal here is to have a prompt, thorough, and fair investigation. Uh, so depending on the situation, you'll likely be interviewing the person who brought the complaint forward, uh, the alleged harasser, and any witnesses identified. And I just said you would be uh, investigating. It's not necessarily uh, the employer themselves who, who conducts the investigation. Sometimes you have situations where an investigation is handled internally and other situations may warrant um, getting a, a third party investigator involved. Now investigations should be kept as confidential as possible, uh, recognizing the fact that it, you can't always guarantee complete confidentiality. Um, witnesses need to be interviewed and some people may be made aware of the complaint, but it should certainly be, the information should certainly be kept to those who really have a need to know. And even people who are interviewed and as part of the investigation may only, um, may, may be aware that something bubbled up, but they may not be aware of everything involved in the investigation. Uh, any, the process that an employer goes through in an investigation should certainly be documented who, uh, and it should be documented while the investigation is being conducted so that all of the steps the employer took, that there's a record of that, any facts gathered, um, that there's a record of that as well. So that um, certainly with time, as like I said, memories fade, that you have a record of what happened and who was involved. Um, so that the employer can, can continue to, you know, keep that in mind going forward if necessary. And then depending on the outcome of the investigation, the employer may have to implement disciplinary action um, and may have to follow up to, to make sure that the behavior hasn't continued and to make sure to be on the lookout for any potential retaliation issues. There's certainly a range of, of behavior that may um, be investigated as part of uh, anti-harassment measures. Certainly something that rises to the level of illegal harassment may result in very strict discipline and, and possibly termination. Um, you can also have, you know, a more yellow category where really depending on the situation, you may, um, you may have to tailor the discipline for that situation. Um, and then it's certainly possible that complaints can come forward where the results of the investigation are that there was no harassment or that there was no violation of the policy. And so that may result in something as simple as a conversation and follow up with those involved to ensure um, no other incidents and no retaliation uh, are taking place. I'll note uh, just before I pass it to, to Aaron is that there, when we're doing training, we like to sometimes uh, tailor training for non-supervisors. We, we certainly suggest that all employees can benefit from regular anti-harassment training and that this is a really good time to go through the policy 
and make sure that people understand what harassment really looks like, uh, understand what some of this unacceptable behavior can look like in their particular workplace, because sometimes the, the distinction between legal harassment and behavior that an employer wants to prevent um, is not always the same. And so it's good to be able to have those conversations with people and say, you know, even if this may not rise to the level of, of a legal claim, we, this is not the behavior that we are, that's acceptable in the workplace. And we want to have a respectful work environment where people can focus on doing their jobs. And you can really cater those conversations to, the, to those employees, to the kinds of work situations that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, that's a great opportunity to go over the anti-harassment policy and complaint procedure. And then finally, uh, it's good to have a manager-specific training where you can really dive into the manager's role uh, and have really clear instructions uh, about what role they play in the complaint procedure and the investigation procedure and all of the follow-up that happens uh, after a complaint comes forward. And you can give, uh, you can even give more management specific work uh, examples um, to really help with the, with the comprehension and understanding of this issue. And with that, I will pass it back to Erin to finish off our discussion. Um, I'm actually gonna cover the last couple slides. Um, this is Lindsay again. Uh, and with the last couple minutes here, we'll just review um, some best practices from a more general perspective in both the context of harassment and harassment policies, and then just a little summary sort of best practice overview for um, addressing issues of workplace violence more broadly. And some of these uh, shown on this slide have already been reviewed by Aaron and Megan, so I'll just touch on a couple um, that I don't really think have already been addressed and I think are important. Um, the first of which is regularly review effectiveness and content of policies and training. Um, this means just making sure that policies are regularly reviewed and that the effectiveness of those policies are assessed. So if you do have a reporting policy in place uh, so that employees can report issues of harassment or discrimination, um, you know, making sure that employees are aware of that policy, making sure that the uh, different avenues provided in that policy, uh, that employees know how to use them, that they are actually effective in allowing employees to report, um, and then making changes to policies as necessary. And the same with training, you know, assessing whether the type of training provided, whether it's a PowerPoint presentation, um, quizzes that are used, uh, you know, more hands-on training with actual practice and participation in dealing with the types of situations that may arise, you know, make, assessing what is effective, assessing what is sticking with employees and what is helping them to understand the issue as well as how to act when sexual harassment or discrimination occurs. And then focusing training on creating a respectful and collaborative workplace versus the specific legal standards. Uh, in the context of manager training, it's definitely important to review the legal standards, particularly as managers will be the ones that you know are generally responsible for these things and could potentially engage in retaliation. Um, whereas individual employees, um, I think it's more important to focus on this idea of a collaborative workplace, a respectful workplace, as opposed to the specific legal requirements and legal standards because that's going to be less of a concern for them on a day-to-day -day basis. They want to be able to recognize when impermissible behavior is occurring, um, but the real focus and the real goal ultimately is to create a collaborative and respectful work environment. And then finally, also making sure that training provided does address such things as unconscious bias and cultural sensitivity um, as these two things, uh, as well as similar concepts, definitely contribute to how employees interact in the workplace and their ability to recognize when certain behaviors may be offensive. Um, so it's important to address those in the context of training as well. <laughs> 
And then going back to workplace violence more generally, um, it's really important to remember that preventing workplace violence and addressing workplace violence issues is not just within the realm of human resources or the safety director or EHS person at a particular work site. It's really a team effort. Um, and all different divisions and departments of an employer need to be working together to make sure that um, a program put in place is effective at addressing workplace violence. Um, particularly, you know, manager involvement and involvement of security personnel as those individuals are the ones who know the facility best generally and are charged with directing the actions and addressing the actions of individual employees. It's also really important to have key business stakeholders involved. Uh, for example, if you have a media relations department or a or PR personnel that work for the company, you want to make sure that they know whether, how, and what to communicate to the media um, if a, work, a serious workplace violence incident occurs and there has to be some response. Um, on the financial side, workers' compensation is generally going to be the sole recourse for workplace injuries uh, caused by workplace violence, so it's important to make sure uh, that the employer knows how workers' comp comes into play and, you know, what, what liability coverage that provides for the employer. Um, and then communicating with the team and ensuring that they are prepared to address a workplace violence situation. Uh, it is important to try to maintain confidentiality where feasible uh, and avoid any potential claim of defamation. Uh, particularly in the instance of responding to a complaint brought by a coworker. Um, so this could be in the context of a sexual harassment complaint like we've been talking about, or in responding to a more significant incident. Um, you know, you de generally want to try to make sure that everyone is on the same page uh, and that confidentiality to the extent necessary is maintained um, through the investigation process to the extent possible. And then finally, um, this just kind of gives an overview of different ways that employers can combat workplace violence and try to prevent workplace violence from occurring in the workplace. Uh, we've already talked about, you know, making sure that there is a workplace violence prevention program in place. Um, you know, one of the contexts in which a zero tolerance policy is more appropriate is likely workplace violence because these tend to be more extreme incidents that might call for, um, you know, immediate action, uh, particularly as Aaron talked about in the context of there being uh, liability for the employer by maintaining an employee who maybe has a history of violence or has had a couple incidents of violence. Um, you know, including workplace violence, administrative and engineering controls. Depending on your facility and your work site, this can take a lot of different forms. Um, but part of developing the workplace violence program is reviewing the particular work site, particular or specific areas of vulnerability, and determining whether things like cameras or panic buttons are appropriate for those working in those locations. Making sure that the program includes a reporting and tracking system for violent incidents. We talked about this a little bit in the healthcare context, but making sure that there's a system in place for employees to report incidents of workplace violence or threats of workplace violence, as well as tracking these incidents to ensure that if there is a particular individual who might have had a few instances um, where maybe it's just threats of workplace violence at first and then something more serious happens, that that's being tracked by the employer so the employer knows um, whether more serious steps need to be taken. And then finally, uh, performing hazard assessments and security analysis of the facility. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then we've already talked about this quite a bit, but making sure that extensive training is provided. <coughs> And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Just in, just in time, Lindsay. I, I feel your pain. I gave a webinar, I think, last year where I, my voice was giving out. So thanks for soldiering through. Um, I don't see any questions. I, I tried to answer most of them directly um, earlier. Uh, I believe those, uh, hopefully those answers were shared. Um, I think other than that, we want to let everybody know that we will be 
announcing our 2020 webinar series, both our uh, employer uh, labor and employment webinars as well as our OSHA webinars uh, in the near future. So watch for those announcements. We have a lot of good programs, uh, I think, that we put a lot of time into planning and, and developing, which uh, we, we really enjoy giving these webinars as much as uh, we hope that you all find them useful and of value. Um, so hope you'll, you'll add, uh, add listening or dialing in or logging in for our webinars to your list of New Year's resolutions. And uh, we look forward to uh, speaking with and working with you all again in 2020. Thanks and happy holidays.